Welcome to Dialogue, a podcast where we unravel the threads of technology that are shaping the future of our world. We discuss technology and software both on high level and under the hood. My name is Lauri Utila, and I'm the CTO at Finitech, the leading freelancer tech talent agency in Finland. And I'm your host on Dialogue, where I'm interviewing top professionals in their fields. So as a software expert, you might not want to miss this. Today I'm speaking with Farsad Yusefzadeh, uh, a lead developer at Stately. Welcome to Dialogue, Farsad. Thank you, Laurie. It's great to, to be here. Thanks for inviting me. You bet. Um, why don't you let the audience uh, know a little bit about you? Uh, tell, sure. tell a little bit about your background and what do you do and, and in your own words. Sure, yeah. So I really like to joke about my role at Stately because I was employee number two at Stately. And uh, you usually call me uh, the Steve Wozniak of <laughs> of Stately. Uh, it's like the Apple Steve Jobs and Wozniak. Anyway, it was a stupid joke. Um, I'm, I'm Farzad, by the way, um, originally an Iranian, but I've been living here in Finland for more than five years. And I work as a, a lead engineer at Stately. Uh, leading the development of Stately Studio, which is a drag and drop based application uh, for for anybody in a software development team. Not only de- developers could be designers or other stakeholders who want to build applications, but they want to build the logic of the application visually. That's what we we're building at Stately. Mm. Before Stately, I was a lead engineer at Epic Games, and I was working on as a part of the online services team, and a whole decade of history before that. <laughs> yeah, well, that that sounds great. Um, f- uh, first of all, thanks for doing this. Uh, we've uh, met like maybe that five years ago. You you had arrived in Finland, I think, and uh, and uh, then we ended up in the same uh, technology circles and um, actually hosted a couple of meetups where you you spoke and and uh, shared your knowledge and wisdom about uh, uh, front end development with React and and also using state machines back then already. So so. It's yeah, not a, uh, like a new thing for you. You've been working on this <laughs> this paradigm for uh, for quite a while, and and um, but um, you you mentioned that you work uh, or lead a lead a technical team, and you you build a uh, tool for uh, any product team to do better product development. Is that like a good summarization of? I, I think that pretty much nails the. The, the core concept of a stately studio, yes. Um, so what the stately studio is, it's uh, it boils down into visually building the flows of logic and scenarios that the user end user can take into any product. Say you have um, like a, um, how do you say, like a walking route planner application where uh, users can go into your mobile application and probably draw a route that they want to walk today, uh, like through the trails and everything, and then start walking. And then, you know, you track them, give them some metadata, like heart rate and things like that. They're, they're like uh, average pace. And then they end the walk session. And then you give them some uh, information, like detailed information and charts and everything about their walk session today. Say you're building that. And then you don't have like the technical background or you're even a developer, but then We'll get to the complexities of product development and see how this whole thing is useful to them. But like in general, if you want to build that application, for example, and if you want to build the whole logic visually, make pictures that can actually be executed into the runtime of your application, that is a stately studio. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So, so it's kind of like I don't want to say visual programming, but but is that like a good metaphor for it? So you can. Instead of um, maybe writing technical specifications or simply like putting the requirements down on a paper and maybe uh, start working on on end-to-end test cases and, and deep, uh, deep, uh, diving deeper down, uh, you, you'd um, kind of visualize first the uh, information flow or how would you describe that? So I would say... For different users from different backgrounds, there is a a special entry into studio and diagramming in general. Um, So any user with their own uh, technical background, uh, they will use it differently. But 
in general, Studio is a way for you. It's not a visual programming application per se, but it's not even a no-code application. It's a low-code application. It helps you generate the code for the parts that actually matter. And that's the business logic of the applications and product in general. Mm. All right. Yeah. Okay. And then, well, you know, yeah, we, we, we'll get to what they are, but they, it works based on an engine and a concept called state charts and state machine that will also later fuel many other things like documentation, testing, and things like that. But we'll get to that in detail in this conversation mm -hmm. today. But how did you uh, initially get into like become interested in, in modeling software and diagrams? I'm really glad you asked that. Um, it was 2018 when we moved into Finland and um, I was, as, as a developer, I was really, really thirsty for speaking and, and listening to other people talk conferences and meetups. And um, one day I was looking at this talk from this so-called guy, David Korshit, who was talking about the concept of state machines and he could practically, he was presenting that you could practically use this concept um, into front-end development, not just front-end development, but like web development in general, and what are the pros and cons and what are the benefits and everything. So it got me thinking, this is too good to be true. If this is such a great way of modeling software logic, then why is nobody using it? Why haven't I heard about it? Like from the beginning, why nobody taught me this when I was a junior developer? Then I got interested. I checked out his library. I checked out the resources that was mentioned in the readme of the library and GitHub, and then it sort of got me in because it's a curse and a blessing. When you know state machines, you kind of see every see them everywhere. It's yeah. sort of the, you know, you, you, you've heard this idiom, the, the golden hammer. When you have a golden hammer, you see every problem as a nail. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like that, but it makes sense. This way, this is a good hammer to have. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> Not yeah. a bad hammer. Yeah. <laughs> sort of like that. So, um, yeah, I got into that. And then I started sharing what I learned about the state machines thanks to you, because I applied to, to the meetup that you were holding in Helsinki. Uh, great meetup, by the way. And then yeah. my talk got accepted. I talked about this, this, this whole thing that I knew about state machines. And it got me interested in it so much. I got hooked five years ago, and I never left, <laughs> never looked back, really. Well, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> but the, uh, the question, I, I just want to offer an opinion on the uh, why is nobody using, why, why or why everybody isn't using state machines, is that um, uh, personally, I think the availability of the tools and libraries for using them is not that great. Do you have the same observation or, or is it just that the, uh, like the, uh, when I talk with people uh, about this, or, or concepts around like state machines, they, they generally accept the idea that it's a, it's a really good way of modeling the thing, uh, whatever you are building, uh, because you, you get the set of rules and, and you get the, um, very good definition of the, of the things that can happen and should happen and not, should not happen yeah. in the software system. Um, that's, that's an interesting, um, I think why why I I share the same same kind of like a view or or wonderment that why isn't everybody using and why I, I why I am not using them as much as I probably should. Yeah, I would say you have a good point in that it's not there is not too many mainstream tooling around this in uh, programming in general. I totally share that sentiment with you, but. I also feel like one of the main reasons that it's not really, it's not massively adopted right now is because um, people think state machines are a um, theoretical concept in computer science. And let's face it, probably half of the uh, development community today are don't have the CS background, don't have the computer science background. That is true, yes, yeah. yeah. I don't so have don't... a CS background, so... I, yeah, me neither. I don't have it too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, what I mean is that when you don't have that background, you don't get introduced to them in college, which traditional yeah, software developers do. And then, yeah, if you don't know them, they feel you feel like it's a little overwhelming. It's a, it's a too theoretical. But in practice, it's really not. Um, I think what David did in his talk was he, he made this aha moment that it clicked for me suddenly that I can use state machines practically thanks to his library. And he brought, it's not just the state machines, actually. His library, uh, it, it, it brought a lot more than just that. But 
I'm I'm really glad that you shared that point because when I got into state machines, I also felt like in the JavaScript community and in front-end development, I'm a front-end developer. Um, that's my expertise. Of course, I do web development, but like I'm great at front-end development. And I felt like when I was starting with the state machines, there was no enough resources, yet alone tooling around it. So I was dipping my toes into this and 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 playing around with with you know the tooling and asking David and other people to how to guide me through, you know, fixing certain problems. That's why I actually was hired in Stately <laughs> when we were making a startup because I was so interested and passionate about it. But to get back on track, my point was we felt like there is a lack of tooling, and that's probably the main reason why we found the Stately in the first place. We, we want to be the tooling based on a state machine, but a lot more than that. A state yeah. machine for us right now is a great concept. We advocate for it. We want people to know it, but we are developing tooling so that people don't even have to know it. Oh, I mean, yes, yeah. why would you care if only what you want to do is build a product? Right. Right. Uh, because it's... it's um, Building a product is uh, complex enough already. Why, yeah. why do you want to know all the not just the state machines but any any other kind of more maybe advanced um concept or paradigm in in software development and if you can abstract that away in 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 a nice manner that then then that that will uh, definitely increase your uh productivity in terms of <clears throat> not having to care about the implementation details that much but just uh yeah. use and implement the behavior so Exactly. And like, if, if there was a product manager in the product team, do they really care about the implementation? If they mm -hmm. cared, we never hired engineers, right? Right. So engineers and developers are the only people who care about the code because we feel like coding and programming is our main, um, main, main tool for maintaining software, not only building mm. it, but also maintaining exactly. it. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. Laurie, you, you run a freelancing firm, right? So yeah. you have worked with freelancers for a long time. You are developer yourself. You're a programmer. You understand this industry pretty well. You have developed a lot of products, maybe dozens and thousands of them. Um, what do you feel like is challenging parts of developing products? Like if you want to build software, what things are challenging for you end to end? Maybe one of the biggest one is, <clears throat> but this is just for me personally, but, uh, but it's probably a challenge that many many people share is is how to get uh, how to get feedback on what you've built. Okay, so are you talking about like developers asking feedback from other developers or no? I'm I'm, I'm I mean getting getting feedback on like having your software or component or what have you being used in a real world scenario mm -hmm. or, okay. or something that's close to it. Uh, which you can uh, simulate pretty much if you do test development or behavior de de development and, and you really do write the use case and the test cases first, then implement on that. So then, then you can, that, 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 way, that way you can test the quote unquote easy part, the business logic part of it. Then when yeah. you expose it to a user, then that's another different story. But, uh, but I, I think like defining Challenging is to scope the requirements down um, to something that um, is going to be valuable for, for the product user, the end user, uh, whether that's a human or a machine or what have mm -hmm. you, it doesn't matter. Um, but for me, I, I think that's, that's the most challenging one. I, I really like that you grouped um, the like the the end users of software because sometimes we build software for humans and so, sometimes we build software for other um, sort of like other other develop not other developers but like the users of your software could be another software when you develop like yeah, abstractions yeah. like libraries i like how you group those two because it's a good perspective to have really i feel like i i also share the same feeling with you in that the, the public facing part of what you're developing is always challenging, of course, because you feel like you you always underestimate what, however people or other software can use what you're building. But looking at like product development these days, I worked as a as a product engineer, I worked as a consultant, I worked as a freelancer, so I kind of understand 
how different parts of product development work. Um, these are like different dimensions into developing product. Um, to me, from the beginning where this is the ideation phase of a product, the challenges start on to the end, which is there is no end to product until you shut it down. <laughs> it's an yeah, yeah. ever growing like roll of how, how to say like garbage or something like that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So um, I remember that when I was working back in Futurize um, as a consultant, we used to send service designer team to clients so that they could validate their ideas into the market by researching the market and and and, and kind of fueling the UX part of the application. So they requirement things for the product to succeed, and then they pass it on to the user experience experts, then to the UI developer, developers, and then the UI designers, and then they worked in conjunction, built an MVP of the product, then you built a product, great, that was the easy part, now you have to maintain it. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, there are many, many people with different backgrounds and different roles who are working in product development. It's really challenging to keep everybody together and to make sure that everybody is aligned and everybody understands the business requirements and what is supposed to happen inside the product at the same level. Yeah, and this is, yeah. of course, probably easier in a smaller startups, but it gets a lot more challenging when you're working in larger corporations. Um, I remember when I was working back at Epic Games, it was always challenging for me to understand what was being built, even by me, <laughs> because... Um, Product requirements change every day, and then users demanded different things on a daily basis. And sometimes we had to change what we were building while we were building it. Yeah, my point is there's a lot of complexity in product development, and every step has its own complexity. But let's forget about everything that goes, you know, uh, before the MVP phase. Let's let's just say that there is a good clear set of requirements and user stories for building a software. We know what's the business logic and then we want to build this using our development team. Yeah. Do you wanna do you wanna you know hop on a journey with me? I wanna I wanna yeah. describe how this I'd works. Love to, yeah. <laughs> so my understanding as a person who's been working in this industry for about a decade is um when you have you should be first of all very lucky if you have a clear set of business logic and user stories yes. in the first place. Yeah. But if assuming you have that um you start building um, the software. You start iterating over this, developing this this product based on the user stories you you have in your mind, and then you build and build and build and iterate on it for like a hundred times. And then when you're really happy with it, when other stakeholders of the product are also happy, um, when the client is happy, you ship it. You ship the version one, the MVP, and only then we start thinking about maintaining software because. Architecting is easy, maintaining is really hard because now you have to, um, you're kind of in the end game and you have to uh, kind of live with the decisions you made in the previous phase. You know, making decision is easy, but like yeah, yeah. <laughs> living up to the consequences. Dealing with the consequences. Are hard. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's maintaining. That's what we call the legacy code base. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when you get to maintaining, now you suddenly remember, um, I know that ideally we want to do TDD, test-driven development. We want to verify the public contract of the software. We want to verify all the features. We want to cover 100% of the product in tests and then ship in full confidence. But in practice, that never happens or that hardly happens. Hardly so we happens, yes. Exactly. We usually are short on time or we have lots of other pressures and then we ship and then... Now everything else is afterthought. Testing is afterthought. Documenting is afterthought. Um, communicating back and evolving on the existing features is afterthoughts. Bug fixing, adding new features, um, modifying existing features. As a developer, it's hard to understand how business logic makes sense along the time, let alone understanding how the code base you're maintaining makes sense, you know, in the, in the long term. When I know what I'm building, I build it, but then I don't remember 100% of how things work. So when I'm trying to build a new feature, how do I make sure that I'm not breaking an existing one? How do I make sure that I'm actually integrating properly with all the existing features? How do I make sure I'm not accidentally producing a bug? You know, there's always a bug in software. We just, in different timings, they show up. 
Yeah, there, there's a, many, many kinds of bugs, you know, like the uh, obvious ones or the, the you made a you made a silly booboo or somewhere and you, it's a wrong type of the the uh, input or output value. But then the, the subtle ones, which are built in the maybe maybe the business logic uh, evaluation or, or the, the algorithms are flawed in some way, not detected. Yeah. You, you didn't pay too enough attention on verifying the rules and requirements there and it's seemingly seemingly working and it might work like on 90 percent of the cases that you yeah that it encounters but then there are 10 percent of cases where the the uh, output doesn't make sense or the result doesn't make sense and you're wondering why that is it seems to be working 100 percent with these other 90 percent <laughs> cases that <laughs> exactly we fine so yeah or tracking those those ones down they, that's hard that's true, yeah. Or like security bugs are hard to de uh, to to um, encounter because there's always security holes. It's just nobody has figured them out yet. Or as a yeah. programmer, you can never certainly confidently say that you have all the edge cases completely covered. Um, it's it's hard for human beings to interpret all the edge cases at once because we have limited capacity of thinking. Some people can yeah. think wider, some people narrower, but at the end, we are limited in thinking. So it's hard to interpret what we're building covers what what percentage of the use cases in the business logic. Um, assuming we even figure out there is a flaw in the first place, as you said. But there are also other challenges. Like, I mean, what if you're hiring a new developer? How do you onboard them into the current code yeah. base? Um, and then there's also like the challenges of building product in the sense of timing, like product managers need to strike a balance between uh, developing new features, fixing existing bugs, and then um, spending some time giving engineers some time to refactor and improve and improve and improve or add tests. Uh, or, or even like, how do you keep the documentation of what you're building in sync with the code base and the evolving of the product in, in terms of engineering so that the, it makes sense because people who don't have a technical background, their probably only way of understanding how software works is by your reports or by reading some sort of document. Yeah. Yeah. And even for like a product manager or, or yeah, well, let's say product manager, uh, they, they've got the product vision, right? Now, yes. Probably like uh, that. This is what we, we've uh, built so far. And this is the, the end goal is to, achieve these uh, features or benefits for the end user also. But then there are the fires that come in, the bugs that are in the system, the uh, change requests that must happen now. And, and how do you strike a balance between optimizing, ensuring that the vision is ultimately fulfilled yeah, uh, and not get tied up in the uh, fires or the short-term changes that uh, usually uh, well, again, prioritize them, w which of them are necessary, uh, uh, which of them are like nice to have, which of them are we're going to accept as won't fix feature. And <laughs> and what are the implications of implementing those for the long-term vision, right? So exactly. that's going to change the, uh, or uh, at least affect the, whatever you're going to build in the longer term, because it, that's new features, new capabilities, new bugs, new things to maintain, everything, so. That's true. So if you think about product as a living animal that has eight legs and hands, you can probably name those eggs and hands. You can say like this hand is documentation aspect. This hand is um, the business logic. This hand is the, the tests. This hand is the code base. This is the business requirements in terms of user stories. This is like end-to-end um, -end tests written from the QA team. You know, there are different, different uh, dimensions or, or different, different ways of interpreting software or product. And then they all have to be in sync with each other. Yeah. Usually what we do is 90% of the time we spend our time as engineers on the code base. And then we try to see if we broke the sync between the code base and any other ones and then go on and, uh, you know, uh, update them accordingly. I'm sure as a programmer, you have encountered a stale documentation like a thousand times. Yes. 
Or no, yeah. no documentation. That's usually the case. Or not. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, would, I would say no documentation is better than sales documentation. <laughs> well, well, yeah, that, that's that's true because then, then uh, you you might be forced to look at the actual implementation. Of yeah, exactly. That way, and then yeah. you know know exactly what's going on if you can understand the code. But, yeah, exactly. But if, if you are given a uh, given a tr- truth. <laughs> the, the wrong sort of the stale documentation and you're trying to work on that and maybe even god forbid you build something on top of that oh yeah <laughs> and, and introduces a new new set of problems and complexity yeah you you realize that this is a stale too far into product development or just too late so you wish you knew that this wasn't even there and then started reading the code base for example or ask yeah. the maintainer um anyway yeah. you also mentioned this um as you, you had a subtle dif- reference to understanding the code base, right? Like reading the code base mm-hmm. from top to bottom and understanding it. Um, I feel like as, as somebody who writes code every day, my threshold for understanding my code is probably about a month. And next month, I probably don't understand what I'm writing today. Or in some cases, if you have a two-year-old toddler, it's tomorrow in the morning mm-hmm. where you don't realize what you're building last night. Um, so my point is, it's not just about hiring new engineers onto the team so that they can go on and read the code and understand, but also it's about you. You don't understand what you're building probably next month. We, you're, you're never in the same context. You, 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 you leave comments, you, 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 you know, you take, you know, technical notes, you update documentation, you write tests. These are your way of understanding how software works. Yes. And, to be fully honest with you, it's not practical. Even if you have all of them in sync with the code, it's not practical. So there's got to be a better way. Okay, what's and the better way? So the better way, in my opinion, is something that's been battle tested from the very beginning of software development, or not even software development, you know, from the very beginning era of people realizing there's pen and paper and they can think using them. Flowcharts. Mm-hmm. We draw mm-hmm. things. We, we draw circles and boxes, and then we draw lines and arrows and connect them together. We try to think about sub problems step by step. Yeah. For example, if I want to understand how my coffee machine works, I say, okay, so it's not even plugged. And then when I plug this in, um, then it turns on and now I can push a bunch of buttons and they will modify, uh, the, the functionality of the coffee maker accordingly. Um, so see, I, I break down understanding something, an existing system into different steps, not plugged in, then I plug it in. I think that helps because you can visualize it using flowcharts. And the moment you visualize, it makes sense. Yeah. Because you can take a look at the picture and you can see everything at once without having to read text or code. Um, you, you've heard this probably. Mm-hmm. A, a picture is worth a thousand words. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so there's a saying because of reason, because pictures make sense, um, especially for, for 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 human beings who understand, like who have a better understanding of uh, some people, like people have different mediums of understanding and learning, right? Some people are visual learners. For example, I'm, yeah. I'm a visual learner. So I understand things a lot quicker and faster if I take a look at a picture that represents something instead of going through code or text. Um, or some people have the like their 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 most optimized medium of learning is their listening so that's why yeah. people some people it makes sense for them to listen to audiobooks but i'd rather read like the traditional book um so people understand things and learn things differently and visualization is for most human beings a better way or a quicker way um so flowcharts why flowcharts made sense was because most human beings could relate to this feeling could understand that if they take a look at something that's broken down into different steps, they understand it. At least they don't feel like they have to maintain all the context in their mind. So nothing, you know, nothing is thrown away or nothing escapes. If, if you focus on step one and two in the picture, then you don't feel like the other ones are running away. They're there. You just will get to them on time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So visualizations make sense. So what if we could visualize building software? What if we could visualize the logic by which the software was working? Would that help? Um, that that <clears throat> that sounds like a sounds like a good idea. But as for me, this why why isn't the first class at the uh, CS program in the university is a drawing class? <laughs> 
So you're saying that this is that there is a drawing class, or there should be a drawing class? Uh, I'm asking why why the first uh. class isn't at the drawing class where you learn the diagram things. Um, that's uh, a should, really good should, question. Uh, like, should it be? Should it be? I don't know why it isn't, but for me, college never made sense because they weren't teaching things in a way that was optimized for me and the way I learned. They had mm. to come up with with a um with with a sequence of topics and all of them had to be textbook and you know based on text just because it's something that's safe that everybody understands just people don't understand it as quick as other ways probably um yeah so, okay, so for maybe me what i'm saying that that the uh um uh, i agree with the benefits of having the skill of diagramming anything like putting breaking it down down into visual form so uh but that that shouldn't be like the university level stuff. That's that's like a problem solving skill that we should probably teach much much earlier in in the grade school or or somewhere along the way to to just to develop a skill uh, or like the habit of of doing that and and like a learning method. If you want to understand something new, here's a one really good way that you can try. It's not not always going to be maybe the method, but it's a method that should be in your toolbox, in your like cognitive toolbox. A hundred percent hard agree on that. I feel like, um, well, I mean, we don't want to put a big question mark on the entire educational system in the world right no, now. No, we don't. No. <laughs> but I would say that my personal experience has been as a kid, I never, I always had better ways of learning than what I was being taught in school. Um, so I was always taking notes, taking summaries, and I was always drawing myself. Um, to be fair, I feel like whenever I take a look at other people as well, other people's notes, I feel like there is also a picture or two there. Um, so yeah, I agree with you because visual diagramming and problem solving are probably two different two different skills to have there is there is over overlap for sure but there are probably two different skills and i feel like problem solving is as important as we if, if not more important as important as visual uh visualizing uh problems problem solving helps you break down a complex problem into sub problems and then those sub problems if you want to share it with somebody else or for your own learning later on for reference or even for you to understand everything at once you can diagram it so two different skills probably. But I agree with you. It should be taught as one of the core tool belts of human being understanding from the very early days. I'm gonna teach that to my kid <laughs> very early on. <laughs> but, um, so if that's just a, such a great method of breaking it down, what are, what are you, if I'm, I'm a skeptic and you, you, you just said to me that the, uh, a diagram is the one of the best tools tools for for that, uh, and I'm I'm skeptic, and I want to ask why. What are the benefits? What do I what do I get for if I uh, pull out the uh, pen and paper and start drawing? Yeah, so uh, diagramming has like a thousand benefits, right? Um, for example, well, first of all, to just get it started, visualizing helps you see the entire picture mm. at once. Whereas with text or going through some script from top to bottom, you can't probably have a window at everything at once. Um, another thing is you see the end and the, um, how do I say, you, you, you see both the breadth of the problem and also the depth of the problem. Because, uh, for now, we can imagine that um, diagrams have different levels. Um, Imagine if you're understanding something, your understanding might be on a higher level than the domain expert. Um, I understand quantum physics based on um, some, some, some probably Google research. I have a physics background, by the way, but uh, I'm just saying that mainstream people like ordinary folks, they understand quantum physics um, on a very high level, okay? Or the relativity theory from Einstein from a higher level. That, that means that the experts on different levels, they have a deeper understanding of, of you know, how this, this whole concept is broken down into different, different like, you know, separate regions. Um, so everybody has their own layer of understanding. And if you were to uh, visualize 
the concept of relativity or, or quantum physics, you would probably pick one of those diagrams. So there are different depths into understanding. There's also different breadths. Like, I mean, how much do you want to cover? The yeah. radius of coverage. So diagramming helps you see both of these dimensions. You have to see both of them. And, it and probably um, what, one thing, if I can interject, the, you can um, when you put down something, you kind of see also the also the boundaries. Exactly. The That's very important. You know why? Because getting back to our software development example again, you're developing a feature and you diagram it right now. There is a border around it. There is there is this place, this certain point. Uh, on the canvas where this feature ends. That's it. That's the territory of this feature. You want to build another feature tomorrow. When you put these two next to each other, where the borders collide, that's where you need to think about integrations. That's where you need to see, see if the, you know, the, the, the feature is that's, that's being worked on can integrate with the existing one, where these borders are colliding into each other. That's where you need to write integration tests. That's probably one of the most trickiest parts of software development where we miss on integrations. Uh, one of the, you know, the, the higher likely sources of bugs in software development are those integration borders. So I agree with you 100% on that, Laurie, and I think that's a really great point. And also, also like in, uh, not, not in, uh, you, can, you can think of it as a, when you're programming on, on a lower level. For example, I, uh, uh, myself, just to give a little, the audience a little bit background. I, I, I write Ruby software, so deal with objects all the time and classes all the time. So what I try to do is uh, follow the solid principles, try to uh, establish the, like the APIs between the classes early on before I move to implementation details. And just to catch myself of not reaching into a domain uh, building, extending the responsibilities of one object that uh, it's going to start messing with things that it shouldn't, yeah, uh, because it doesn't have a clear interface uh, to the to the rest of the system. Uh, so that's why I why I raised the boundaries as an idea because it's really helped me along on, on, on in my personal software development. Right. Just yes. making making sure making sure that. Uh, only these things will belong here in this component or this system or so forth. And and like establishing the boundary, why it's helpful is that when you get a new requirement, to get a new idea, get a new feature request or something that kind of forces you to think, where is this going to go? Will it, will it be in this feature or this feature? Will it be a totally different one? And, and yeah. how it's going to react? And, and, I, and I'm not putting it directly straight into one bucket and and, uh, and and then going away implementing it so that's a that's a great way of thinking about the breadth of the features yeah so do you want to extend the breadth of the current feature by the new requirements or as you said do you want to make a whole new region of responsibilities inside the application yeah. if you do how would that work with the other ones now <laughs> yeah so you see there is a lot of underestimated and hidden complexities in software development and it's not even that. I mean, I mean, I can go on and on to just to take a break from from the benefits of diagramming because there's still a bunch of other benefits we can refer yeah. to. Just opening a parenthesis here, um, there's a lot of complexity other than coding, as we mentioned in programming. Um, but like even in the product development itself, there's also some hidden complexities. Say, front end developers have to deal with cross browser compatibility, or <clears throat> generally programmers need to deal with uh, cross-platform deployment of their, their runtime, or um, there's accessibility challenges for any user interface. Um, there's security challenges to any server-side uh, you know, uh, communication between different microservices, for example. Um, yeah, so there's always this sort of hidden and underestimated complexity. Oh, here's also another great thing. I was reading up on something called, um, there are different, um, how do you say, like official academic names for complexity. There is something okay. called uh, accidental complexity, and there's one thing called inherent complexity. So say you're trying to solve a problem. Um, that problem can be complex on its own. If you're 
if you're trying to make a route planner and then you're trying to draw a mesh of all the possible points on the map and then here are like you know then then assign weights onto the graph of routes let's go from this this city to the other city it's there is no tro uh, tolls in in the, in the highway so there's a lower cost, so probably more prioritized if I want to show you a route between these two cities. So you see like there, this, this whole problem of drawing a map and showing available routes between different cities, for example, if you were developing Google Maps, uh, it's, it's inherently a complex problem to solve. It's, there is a lot of complexity onto the problem itself, but there's also a lot of accidental complex, complexity that we introduce into our product development on a daily basis. Accidental complexity is a type of complexity that comes accidentally from your implementation, from your solution. If you were to develop a Hello World application, if you chose a tech stack, I mean, you probably can choose almost any tech stack to accomplish that. But if, you, if I were to show a Hello World text in a browser, I can choose HTML page. I can choose an entire bundler based React application going server side and everything just to render that paragraph. So the Next.js application or like the, the React based application still accomplishes the same output, but it introduces a lot of accidental complexity because the solution is too complicated for the problem. That's yeah. accidental complexity. So there are also these sort of terms. If you think about them, um, what tech stack do we choose? What solution do we choose for fixing this particular problem, developing this feature, fixing this bug? Um, so these are all, you know, I just wanted to open a parenthesis here and say that there's a lot of these sort of hidden complexities we just that just never occur. We just don't realize them on a daily basis. Anyway, getting back to um, benefits of diagramming, we, we, we covered uh, breadth and depth and we covered like seeing the entire system. At the same time, you can also zoom on part of the diagram, right? Um, if, you're, if your diagram is too large now, just because the problem has a higher inherent complexity, it's a complex problem by nature, it's almost impractical for human beings to, to see the entire thing at once, even if you visualize it. So you can zoom on one part of the problem, try to think about modeling that, then zoom out, zoom in onto another end of the diagram, try to also solve that now. So you, you're, you're freely moving inside a map of business logic and, and logic to, to, to understand what sort of thing you need to tackle right now. You don't have to solve the entire problem at once. That's another way of, because if you have the diagram, you visually can plan your way around the problem. Um, and talking about planning, um, one part of our job as programmers in a product development team is to estimating how long uh, something takes. <laughs> like agile, agile based teams, they, they use t-shirt sizes. I want to say this is like a large problem. This is an extra small problem. Usually our estimates don't live up to, we usually don't live up to our estimates um, because we either overestimate something or underestimate it. It's, it's really hard to accurately describe a problem and, and your solution. Um, I suffer from that problem all the time. <laughs> I want to confess Likewise. that right now. Right. <laughs> yeah. it would probably, if you ask like uh, 100 engineers, 95 of them will tell us that they share the same feeling with us. Well, if we explore that topic a little bit in, in yeah. just uh, the estimation problem, um, what are your, what are your experiences on why why that's the case? I, I, can, I can share a couple of ideas from my my side or experiences. I probably don't underestimate the um, actual implementation of the business logic, the pro like the problem that I need to solve, the the specific problem. But then integrating and tying that back to the whole system, that's that's where uh, uh, I trip up, and I'm too optimistic usually. Mm -hmm. but that's the case, uh, and then then there's always the um, um, or I try to catch myself into falling that I, if I have to do this, what it will, what if, uh, what's the amount of time that I need for it if I put 100% of my focus in it? Because usually you can't do that all the time. Uh, you have to, uh, 
you've got other responsibilities, other tasks that you need to carry out through the day, and you may be able to devote, let's say, half of your time to to writing software or being doing the things that actually do solve the <coughs> do solve the problem, and then the unforeseen things that come up, uh, like buffer, uh, setting up a buffer for that, and also like the the the, the uh, old context switching cost which is always the i i feel that always the case at least for me that if i especially when the problem is is something that i need really need to devote my full attention and, and probably require some really creative thinking yeah then then it takes a while to get into the flow that you actually get at least like the first uh, first hypothesis of how you could solve the problem. They're, 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 those are still usually wrong yeah, or, or they are incomplete, <clears throat> but, but to get into the flow that takes time. So, so uh, for me, uh, the estimation usually fails a little bit because of those factors. What do you think? I think I share most of that with you. Um, there are, I, I, I think the main reason why we can't accurately estimate something is because we don't we don't account for life in general yeah and we don't account for that we are human beings we have we have lots of flaws um sometimes you're just not in the mood of thinking just that the thoughts true. the elegant solutions don't come to you sometimes as you said you're switching between different contents uh, contexts we also the estimates are also a relative number to the person's expertise it might be a large t-shirt size for me, but it might be an extra small for you because you just simply know the system at that point better than me. Um, or, I mean, there, there's a lot of, you know, obstacles also along the way. There are surprises that show up when you dig deeper. Sometimes it's because of the lack of the skills in which we didn't just foresee all the complexities, foresee all the edge cases. Yeah. It's sometimes under, it's because... Unearthly. Complexity yeah. that's hidden. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes it's just because the tooling fails us. Or sometimes it's because we just never realized that we have to have like a pre-research phase. We didn't break it down enough. Uh, you know, there's just a lot of reasons for us to fail. Honestly, I'm surprised estimating just works for some people. <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> I see a thousand ways for this to fail. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I think like my, my way of overcoming complexities and estimation is to understand things better. If I, if I have a better understanding of things, even, even I have a better understanding of myself and my own velocity, my own performance, I can estimate more accurately. I can't do anything with diagramming in terms of understanding myself. <laughs> um, self-awareness comes from uh, soft skills, but... Diagramming at least helps me understand the system I'm building, yeah. the problem I'm solving. Yeah. So one of my go-to ways is that, you know, for 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 years, Laurie, as you mentioned in the beginning of this 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 whole discussion, we, me and my colleagues, um, some of us, we 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 advocated for for the idea of using state machines and state charts for 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 a couple of years, for a few years at conferences and meetups, and whenever we met somebody else, we tried to share this. But then we also realized that this might be an intimidating and overwhelming concept. And some people might not want to just, you know, um, write their logic in, in this particular way just to have a more solid, upfront, deterministic solutions into their problems. So we realized instead of advocating for state machines, we might as well keep that as an implementation detail and advocate for diagramming. Mm. Many people relate to diagramming. We have I can confidently say all the human beings on earth have diagrammed at least once in their lives, directly yeah. or indirectly. So you understand how things work on pen and paper. You can draw a bunch of boxes and arrows. Why don't you do that for your day-to-day -day job as a programmer? It doesn't have to be building a whole complex software. It doesn't even have to be software. It could be anything. If you're planning to buy a house, why don't you model that in different steps? You have to first figure out how to get a loan from the bank. First, probably you need to even find a bank. So these are the steps. You can draw a flowchart for that. Why don't you diagram everything? It's a great way of planning how to approach different problems in life. 
Yeah, I guess that comes maybe a little bit back to the uh, question or issue that it's, or fact that it's not a learned skill in, yeah. in the sense that people know how to draw, but uh, how to how to use drawing in problem solving situation that that might be a little bit different. Uh, yeah, beast for them, and 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 if they don't have the, if they've never taught like the fundamentals, uh, or, or the like the best best practices or best ways to do it. Maybe you can touch on some of those at some point. But uh, if you don't have that uh, foundational knowledge on how to break down. A little bit more complex problem than than uh, drawing a simple thing on a, on a paper. Then then that that's why it might be uh, uh, people might find it hard to get started. And and especially if you introduce like a next level diagramming, the state machine diagrams. Then yeah, I can really see why that that you've you've experienced that people get intimidated by them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's sort of a lost art or. As I said, like an uh, untaught skill in general. Yeah. And uh, to me, sometimes it also resonates that people also have some sort of deeper problem in the sense that they don't understand what's their best way of learning at all. Some people don't know if they learn by text or by visualization or by audio. As human beings, we all have the most optimized way of learning. There are different mediums of learning, and there's a science behind that. Um, so we might as well know ourselves. So and then, then optimize our job or our life according to that. Um, so yeah, diagramming makes sense for everybody, not only developers. Uh, as a as say, I am. I have an idea to build. I'm not a developer. I don't even. I haven't even touched software in my life. How do I turn that diagram into an existing practical functional application? Um, well, with the LLMs today, <laughs> that might be way too simpler now. And I'm glad because it's making software, making software more available to uh, more like to a broader set of folks uh, other than developers and engineers. Uh, but assuming that there was no LLM, we'll touch on that later. Assuming there was no AGI and no LLM right now, um, diagrams could be a great way of describing what you wanted and then even find some tooling that automatically turns those diagrams into a, 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 an executable software. Because diagrams are an abstract general purpose way of describing a problem, you can almost translate that to, to any solution. You can translate that to any language, programming language. You can translate that to any framework instead, inside that programming language. You can implement them in any programming diagram. The, all you need to do is to interpret a diagram. So they need to, the, the, the non-technical stakeholders who want to build product or who want to share the requirements of building something into the product, you know, in, in the diagramming, but it has to be written or stored in a format that you can then use some sort of programming language or programming tool to interpret and then convert to other formats, which, which, which is a really, really dreamy idea. What if, if I were to build a software, even as an engineer, I could diagram what I had on my mind, in my mind, I could iterate on my diagram. I could simulate and walk through the diagram. I trade on it a couple of times until it's, it satisfies me and then say, okay, this is the time I want to commit to this solution. I think this works. I think this represents the flow pretty well. Um, then if at that point of committing to that solution, to that diagram, you could somehow automatically translate that to something that made sense. Because if you think about it, we were discussing these different, this, this octopus with eight Eggs and like legs and um, hands uh, for software. We we're using that as a representation of the software. Everything, the documentation, the testing, the code base, all of them are sort of the side effects of the logic. It's the business yes. logic that needs to be represented in these different formats. So all of them are different interpretation of the same logic that they have to always be in sync. And we are babysitting that right now. We are catering for all of that, whereas this shouldn't be our job. Our job should be to build products and focus on the product part. Um, to me, testing 
is a low-level way of making sure that code works. I feel like testing should be abstracted away from me. Why would I need to verify an implementation? All I wanted is to just some logic turn into a product. Um, so what we do at the Stately is we give you a way to draw your diagrams uh, using our Stately Studio. It's a web application, but there's also a Visual Studio Code uh, extension for it for only developers. Soon, most of the uh, mainstream IDs and text editors will have it as well. Um, the web applications works in a way that you go on and drag and drop a bunch of um, entities, and then well, we'll get to that entities later. Say a bunch of boxes and then a bunch of arrows that connect them in a certain way. You build a graph. You build a map of the software. You can simulate how it works. You can even deploy it to to a live application. You can make it a serverless workflow. You can make it. Uh, like a RESTful API. You can make it a front-end React component. You can make it almost anything. It's a diagram, so it's not tightly coupled to any implementation. When you're diagramming, you don't you can choose how you want it to be exposed. Maybe you're building a component on the front end that should be implemented using Angular, React, Vue. You've seen the headless components, uh, how they are uh, general purpose. They're not tightly coupled to the implementation. That those are basically diagrams, only that they're not even tightly cu tightly coupled to to the language itself or to the framework itself. So those are diagrams. Um, you can even deploy it as different. What what if you want the same logic, but um, you wanted it? To, you you built the same logic as as a like continuous integration sequence, for example. You built a CI, and now you want part of that logic to be in your Node.js SDK. So you want the same thing, you want the same states, you want the same events, same sequence, but it differently deployed onto different solutions. Diagrams are great because you can just tell certain software um, to deploy it differently. As long as the diagram is the same, you know that the logic will be the same. So you don't have to re-verify that. Um, yeah, so Stately Studio gives you a way to build that. Soon you will be able to um, input different formats you can write plain English and describe what you want to build. You can mm -hmm. directly go and drag and drop and build the ar like build the boxes and arrows and diagram yourself. You can tell us in Markdown. You can record a voice and do that. <laughs> you can, if you have a state machine already, paste that. If you have a code already, paste that. Um, different inputs turn into a general purpose engine for diagramming that can also translate to different outputs. If you want a sequence of user stories in Gherkin statements to pass it on to the QA engineers, you can export it this way. If you want it to be a SVG diagram that can be embedded on GitHub, you can export it to um, Mermaid, which is the um, which is like a tool that GitHub supports. Um, you can export it to an executable code for a certain library that can run it in runtime. That's where XSAID, the state chart implementation library from our team comes in, the open source library. Um, the City Studios also has a very, very generous free tier right now. So you don't have to pay. I mean, you can pay if you want live collaboration and multiplayer diagramming inside your team. Um, or even if you want private like diagrams, but everything else is free, really. Um, if you were to use the VS Code extension, uh, it worked both ways. We're really proud of that bi directional editing. You can, if you're familiar with exostate state machines and the code, you can write the code and in a live way, it will sync it with the diagram. So you will see the diagram in the editor updating based on the code. Okay, so you're tired of doing the coding now, switch on, change the diagram and the code will be generated for you in sync. So there's a bi-directional editing between these two. For anyone interested, exostate is, is the implementation of state machines concept and state charts in general in TypeScript and JavaScript. It's fully written in TypeScript. Version four has been around for, for about three and four years. Version five is right next door. Um, the alpha is out, beta is coming at the end of the month, if not at the end of this week. Um, and yeah, so the the, 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 the library Exasate is uh, open source, but if you not want to write state machines yourself, and want to even abstract it away for other people, or you're just an engineer who wants to drag and drop and, and diagram, you can do the diagram using this Stately Studio, yeah. which will 
one of the outputs is the state machine for exastate to run it in your application. And then you can run it in React, Vue, in JavaScript, even pass it on to another interpreter of a state charts in like Python or Rust or .NET. Uh, some of these that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, these ideas are not yet available, but are being actively worked on. Some of them are planned for the next year, but they're gonna be there. Most of what I talked about today are there already. Um, so it's great to check us on at uh, stately.ar. But I don't wanna make it about, you know, the product and marketing this. I'm only advocating for this because there's a very good free tier and everybody can benefit from using it. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. And and that's why, what, what would be your like, let's say let's say I'm, I'm leading a team of five people. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm listening to this conversation and I'm now convinced that, okay, this is something that I, I don't know if it works for us, but I want to try it. Mm -hmm. How should I go about it? So I would say, um, if you want to try, um, I would say, I mean, try like seriously. Why? I mean, not just get a, set up an account there yeah. uh, at, at Stately, for example, or, or any other similar platform or just yeah. pull out pen and paper. But I want to, as a group, my team, we want to try to see if this way of working works for us. So uh, I, how would you recommend we go about it? I, I go about introducing the concept of state machines and state charts and learning extra state at first. There's a little bit of learning curve, but if you just want to know the basic building blocks, it's going to take you probably a couple of hours. And uh, once okay, you know- Okay, so that could be something like, uh, are, there, are there any good public, lectures about it like you on youtube any anybody from the team court team yes. maybe describing the yeah thing. yeah so, so there is you, you could watch that as a as an introduction and then have a discussion together about it yes Did we understand what the concept's about exactly so i would say to go about learning the concepts there is a ton of conference talks from david Korshid on youtube on different conferences there's a ton of other uh, discussions and and, and uh, conference and meetup talks from the other uh, people in the team including me um, those are also great, but if you want a focus way of learning, I would check out stately.ai slash docs. And I'm sure that these links will be shared later. There is a, um, there is a centralized documentation for both the open source library and the tooling around it, the stately tooling around it, including the web studio in one place at stately.ai slash docs. Um, I'll go about learning the basics of the state machines there. And um, it will go through the basic primitives, the basic building blocks, and also covers why you want to use the state machines in the first place. If this this whole discussion today wasn't convincing enough, um, and then I would um, there's also um, a couple of uh, front end masters workshops from David uh, David Korshit. Um then um, yeah, so once you feel like you know a little bit about state machines and state charts, that should be enough for you and your team to get into a stately studio. Uh, a stately studio, you can uh, use your GitHub account to log in into it. You don't even have to make a uh, new account with us. Um, then uh, you, can, you can go on into the studio and build your machines from scratch. Or if your team has explored state machines when they were learning it a little bit and made some example machines, you can use the Visual Studio Code extension to index them and show the diagrams, but those are not saved in our database. So you can also import them from GitHub if you want them to be saved with us in the cloud, for example, to use all the benefits like um, essentially Sky and live deployments, live sim simulation and things like that. So yeah. Okay, what would be like a um, good good size of a problem that, that my team should try? So that's uh, solving or, or modeling with the state machine. The thing or, is, with the diagrams. With it's a really, really great question, Laurie, because um, building diagramming and state machine solutions, um, you can think of problems at different levels. Are you wanna? Are you are you going to solve a problem local to a particular place in the in the product? Say, JavaScript application, React code base, right? I think it's popular enough. Um, so if you do you want to build a state machine for a complex interface inside the React component, great, you can do that. Do you want to build a global a state machine for sharing logic, like solid logic across the application for different components? 
you can use a state machine for that. And there's also the concept of actors. Um, so break your application into different parts. Your application has a way to show notifications. Your application has a way to route and navigate between different pages. Um, there are forms and interactive elements around. Some of them need to talk to each other and based on certain states, some, some stuff should happen on the page. Uh, there is a complex calendar. There is uh, some, uh, l let's say there is a decision tree that you need to do different things based on different states in the application. You can break all of these down into different actors. You can say, I have a notification actor that whenever I tell it to show up, it will show up with this certain message. Um, I have a oh. calendar actor that will abstract away all the complexities of dealing with an interactive accessible calendar into a state machine. Um, I have a um, global supervisor, supervisor state machine that knows what needs to be spawned into the application, what actors should be available in the application based on what mode the user is in, right? If, if I have an application that is in read-only mode, if I share a Google Doc with you that you, you don't have permissions to edit, my application is in read-only mode, and you probably don't want the editing actor to be available at all. So usually, traditionally, what you do is you make the logic available, you just guard against it. You just say, if the user doesn't have right permission, don't do it, but the logic is there. With actor model, if you have different actors, you can tell them that this actor doesn't even have to be spawned if you're in the uh, read-only mode. I don't want editor actor to be available in read-only. I only want it when the user has the permission. So you can build a supervisor, a state machine that spawns a tree of logic. Similar to a tree of React components and UIs, you can have a tree of logic. And all of these little actors can talk to each other. Some of them can talk globally to each other. Some of them can talk uh, locally to each other. The way you orchestrate it is on your own. You can build state machines in the global scope that can send events to each other. You can build state machines inside a component that are not available outside the scope of this component. That's how you structure your own code. Even your actors don't have to be state machines. The complex ones can be state machine. The normal ones, a data fetcher actor, for example, is simple enough to be a promise. It doesn't have to be a state machine. Yeah. That can be an actor as well. In If you're keen to check this out, this is called the actor model architecture. I have a talk about this in uh, last year's React Finland conference. Um, it's, it's a conference for React and JavaScript, but the, the talk is general purpose enough for anybody to uh, get some insights out of it. Um, it talks about actor model. People who are coming from the Java programming language, they have probably heard of a framework called Akka. And Akka is the actor model framework in Java. Um, actor model is an architecture that was uh, inspired by human body. In, in human body, the way the brain and different muscles talk to each other is as if the brain is a supervisor actor that spawns different muscle actors and manages and supervises how different messages are being sent between different muscles. Um, and sometimes the brain interprets the inputs from the eye and then sends like um, uh, like it, like sends messages according to the interpreted data from the eye onto different things. Like for example, the eye, like your eyes, they see a threat. Like a, somebody throws a rock at you. Eyes get that information, pass it onto the brain. Brain interprets it as danger, and then um, sends proper messages to certain muscles in your like cert, like let's say your finger points, and then they, it tells them to just do this to make a shield and protect you. That's how actor model actually works. Um, actor model is a way to see application as a way that everybody, everything in the application is an actor, and then these actors can talk to each other. You need a brain actor probably, and you need a bunch of other muscle actors in the application. If a person is disabled, brain knows that some, some muscles are disabled, so there is no spawn actor for those muscles. If you need like a uh, if you need um, a, a sort of phrase that makes sense, uh, I don't know if it's accurately mm -hmm. true, but yeah. like, but it's even great because, in, like, I mean, I can go on and on about actor model, but I'm sure you can do your own research on this. Actor model yeah. is a way that you can orchestrate state machines or non-state machine actors inside your application, so they go hand in hand, uh, but they're different things. Well, you you did mention now no, that, that this is probably a good good uh, bridge to the uh, realm of artificial intelligence as the uh, yeah. actors 
uh, or actor models, or how would you describe all the all the recent uh, papers and and proof of concepts uh, regarding how how people have been extending large language models like OpenAI or or other ones to to perform tasks um, complex than what they can provide as an input to the model. What, what are your what are your thoughts on on well, we, you you can start from anywhere you would. Yeah, <laughs> you start with the actors and the AI, or just the AI in general, or the um, language models. Or I'm not really sure how uh, the recent era of generative AI and LLMs can fit into um, traditional architectures yet, just because we haven't had enough time to figure this out. Um, but I think in general. LLMs and generative AI is used for outputting code, right? Um, so it's great for you. If, if you don't know how to build software, it's a great way for you to make software because you can just pass on your requirements to um, as, as prompts into some model. And then that generative model will output like a, let's say that you're such a great prompt engineer who can output like an existing uh, like bug free application out of it. But still, I think there's benefit in diagramming and teamwork in general because one, we need operators, human operators, even yeah. on powerful machines like LLMs. And two, we still want a way to communicate between each other. Um, diagrams yeah. not only solve the aspect of maintaining code, they don't particularly care about the code as the implementation. They care mostly about the way we communicate and convey different requirements between each other. I worked at big corps enough to understand that when business requirements uh, are coming from the directors, part of the logic and requirements get lost until they reach the engineering team. Yeah. Yeah. So there should be a way to optimize this. And that's probably diagramming for all short. I have a really fun story. Um, this does, didn't happen to me, but it happened to one of my colleagues at Epic Games. Um, so Epic Games has a flagship product called Fortnite, the uh, very famous game. Um, so Fortnite was very great for Epic in terms of financials and like the uh, audience reach and everything. Uh, Fortnite developers, they use probably some sort of system language like C++, C or C Sharp or something. And then they build certain logic into Fortnite and around it, like um, user management and things like that. Um, the web developers in Epic Games, they wanted part of that logic uh, to be passed on to the web team uh, so that we had a cross of this logic inside the web application as well. Um, they didn't know, they, they, they got the logic, but they didn't, they didn't get all the parts right. So they wanted a way to communicate with C Sharp developers and Fortnite developers. They what they did was they used Exasafe and <laughs> state machines. They passed on the machine config, which is a JSON object, to um, to to the Fortnite developers from a completely different tech industry. Um, they showed them the way to visualize it using the visualizer. They pasted the code there. They saw the visualization. They already knew it, a state machines because they're game developers. Um, so they knew yeah, state yeah. machines. They heavily use mm -hmm. it in games. So yes. they knew how to fix this. They fixed the JSON object with a new logic, passed it on to the web team, web team pasted it into the code base and it worked. Um, so this sort of communication and getting back lost parts and pieces of information and requirements is still something LLM won't fix. LLM is great for... Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah, pro yeah. I mean, not yet, I would say. Not yet. Not yet. At, at, at least we don't know how to... How to harness them in that way right yeah, now. So. Exactly. But if you're somebody who hires a prompt engineer, the way you want to explain what you want is a skill. Uh, and one yeah. great way of doing it at is by diagramming what you have in your mind. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, in general, we are also using, um, we, we are exploring most of what we do at Stakely is um, it's uh, exploring uncharted territories really. Uh, we do a lot of internal tool development. No, not an internal, what we say, we would internally develop lots of tools for our users. Lots of linting rules, type generation, code generation rules, lots of, you know, like, you know, fooling around with language services and stuff like that. Uh, but we, we also like, you know, what, what I wanted to say that we do a lot of non-mainstream 
uh, tech playing in a stately, if that makes sense. Um, and we are dipping our toes into this whole area of AI, um, generative AI and, and reinforcement learning. We understand that GitHub Copilot as one of the AGI models or chat GPT, for example, GPT-3 and 4, they are trained with so much code that they already understand how to fix your state machines to some extent. They are great at outputting your state machines as well. They will help mm -hmm. you probably lint your models. They will probably help you generate a state machine based on what you want, based on natural language. But we want a lot more than that. We don't want people, because LLM still assumes that you know what you want, or at least you can iterate enough on the prompt to get what you want. But what if you don't know what you want? What if you want like the AI part to research that for you? What if you want the AI to develop different alternatives for you? That's where reinforcement learning comes in, where you want you have an uncharted environment and then you want an AI agent to explore that for you based on some initial criteria and then give you insights enough for you to navigate it through different different routes, different different approaches. So we are we're we're betting on LLMs right now. We're betting on generative artificial intelligence right now, but it's not the end game for us. We are we're putting some eggs in the um, reinforcement learning basket. Still, lots of research to be done. Still, plans for the next couple of years, but we'll see where we get with the studio with that. Yeah, but in general, it's it's great uh, for for anybody. Um... The capabilities that the LLM has in in terms of being able to uh, increase your productivity by a lot. So, so one one example is is that the uh, people shouldn't have to uh, have to deal with the uh, blank white paper syndrome anymore at all in any any uh, task or problem that they have. Hardly agree with you. Uh, yeah, um, hardly. I mean, I strongly agree with you. <laughs> Not that yeah, I don't. Yeah. Do. yeah so. <laughs> so 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 uh you you never have to like think what i'm going to put uh, put uh, down on a paper to get started with the problem yeah if you if you're suffering with that you can still ask ask a simple question about the problem you use the llm to generate the um like the first impulses for you for your brain to interpret that read in and and like stimulate you yeah to work on the problem they can give so you that, a that, framework for learning. Yeah, that's yes, for sure. Yeah, so that, I think that's that that's something that everybody should be using, regardless if of they're course. working in yeah. whatever field. So, yeah. so ho highly highly encourage all of the audience to uh, try out and start playing with the uh, we with the generative AI uh, models. Yeah, in in really in their day to day work, just pick it, pick a tool of your choice on the side and and. When you start working on something, ask the AI first. Even yeah. though you 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 might even decide beforehand that you're never gonna touch the uh, or use the whatever output the model makes, but just to get you jump started to solving the problem. Well, my 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 rule of thumb in terms of using ChatGPT. By the way, I mean I didn't mean to uh, underplay. Uh, like generative AI and LLMs in general. I no, mean, I, I don't think you did. No, no. Yeah. Okay, so great. Um, I didn't want to imply that. I wanted to say that I myself, for one, use ChatGPT every day because it helps me because um, I usually need a rubber duck to bounce off ideas. And yeah. I use my uh, like AGI agent to do that for me. I give them ideas. I, I say, here's what I wanted to do. And here's what I'm thinking. What do you think? Is there, way, is there room for improvement? How would you improve this if you were me? And the more I train it, <laughs> with, with the more I feed my thoughts to it, the more the, the closer it gets to me and the way I think. And it's great because regardless of, I don't think developers really need to be worried about their job. I think they need to be worried that part of their job, which is repetitive and sometimes boring, is going to be taken away from them, which is for, for good, right? For good reasons, because you, you have yeah, time to yeah. focus on more important things, things that matter. Um, you, you have more time to think about the benefits of the end user who's using your products. Um, and then you, you, you have a better chance of discovering what you can do to improve your, um, you, your software and product without having to do the work yourself. But there's also cons, like you still have to verify the accuracy of the output of LLM because they work on prediction, based on prediction. And 
for some people, it just doesn't work. For example, if you're doing, um, if you're working on things that haven't been, there is no prior art to them. You have to do some sort of research. Elements might not be a great fit for you because there is no reference for them to be trained on. Uh, so you need to mm -hmm. uh, kind of be the content producer yourself, in a sense. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's one one thing where I've uh, personally I think it's great that uh, practicing with it on on stuff like that, where where you know that the uh, model does not have prior knowledge about it. Yeah, is is great because that that helps you while while the, the results that you get out of the LLM might not be anything groundbreaking or not give you new ideas, but but it shows, I think it refines your uh, questioning skills. Yeah. So that you're not introducing too much of your own bias and your own ideas yeah. into that. Because if you do, you get your own ideas back, usually. Exactly. Uh, on those cases where, where there is no prior art to refer to. Uh, or no, it does not have any, any. Um, I, I don't know even enough about the model, so I could explain it in terms of uh, how it technically works. But, but you get my point. So, so yeah. um, that's the like practicing your questioning skills is. I think it's a important thing. So we're getting back to the problem solving skills. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are. You need to know what you want. You need to be able to explain it. And you need to be able to question it. Um, and yeah. LLM is great for that because you can bounce off ideas and act as if it's your rubber duck. Uh, you're per programming with an agent. And I think you need to use the most out of it. Almost everybody now, whatever they're doing, regardless, they should use it. It's a great tool for um, productivity and boosting your performance. And um, if there's a tool, why don't we use it, right? I mean... It only makes sense to use it. And I think uh, AI agents is like a special domain specific agents are soon a lot earlier than what you think, a lot sooner than what you think are going to be a thing. And I think, uh, I don't know if you've watched the movie Hair, but um, Hair was... I think I've seen it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so for people who haven't watched it, it's it's about the um, AI agent that is booted up as your operating system that, that can be yeah. deployed to your mobile and a mobile phone and your 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 laptop or computers and it's uh, the character makes a relationship like a human like relationship with the ai agent i don't think like i mean that's superficial but part of it that helps you reply uh officially and better um to like you know uh to emails or part of it that interpreted and in, like uh, prioritize information on a daily day-to-day -day basis for you. Those are going to be a lot sooner available to everybody in the world. Probably just give it a year or something. Look at OpenAI last year and look at it today. Look at Midjourney V2 and V5 and uh, see the difference. It's, there's like a huge pace of development right now in this area. And I think everybody needs to be up to speed about learning how to use them uh, the way that it makes sense for them. Well, Fasa, it's been a great conversation so far. How would you, um, if people were, while they've listened to this, uh, what would be the one thing that you'd want them to remember? I would want you to remember, okay, can I go for three or four things <laughs> instead of one? Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I would want you to remember that you need to understand how you learn. Find your most optimized medium of learning then try to use that medium of learning on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're a programmer or anybody who works with products directly or indirectly, um, you need to understand what's the best way you're learning and you need to incorporate that into your development team, into your product team. Diagramming is a great way to breaking things into sub-problems and explaining them and keeping them as a reference. And they are a great way to keep this as a single source of truth for the logic of your application. Think everything else is a different representation of the diagram you're making. And I think if you incorporate this in your team, the communication is gonna be a lot more accurate. There is a less chance for uh, losing information along the way and just less friction in conversations in general. And I think diagrams are not enough. You need a way to um, sort of think a lot better. And I, and I hope that Stately Studio can give you that 
I, I hope that this is what we're aiming for in a stately, and I hope that you check us out and at least give us a fair shot. Mm -hmm. Fasal, it's been a great, a great uh, time talking to you, and uh, thanks for joining us on Dialogue. Thank you very much for inviting me, Laurie, and uh, I enjoyed every bit of it. I feel like this has been a really friendly and beneficial chat, and um, I really, really want to uh, think like there is a good, bright future for everybody uh, incorporating diagramming and uh, AI in general. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much and have a nice day.